I met Sandra on a Saturday afternoon at a grocery store in our hometown. Not the most appropriate place to meet your wife, but I succeeded. She noticed that I was having trouble finding the right kind of meat and offered to help me with it. I agreed and jokingly told her that I really needed to find a wife like her. She obviously had a great sense of humor and, with a warm smile on her sweet face, told me that she was available and I could ask her to do it. We both burst into laughter, and it ended with me asking her out to dinner that evening, and she accepted. The dinner went great and ended with breakfast at my apartment. Since we were both singles, we had fun and great sex, and a month later she moved in with me, very soon indeed, but that suited us fine. We were able to put away a good amount each month. We got a great opportunity when a construction company built 32 houses in a new neighborhood that they were selling at reasonable prices and on credit. We happily bought one of them, moved in, got married, and she got pregnant. Most of our neighbors were young couples like us, and we made many friends among them. We had a great marriage for the first three years, but then things went downhill. That turned out to be a divorced woman named Lola, Sandra's best friend at the time. While vacationing in Greece, she had met a professional English soccer player, married him, and left town for England before Sandra and I had even met. After several warnings to Lola for her growing interest in a dissolute lifestyle, the soccer player had had enough when he found her naked in a shabby hotel after a tip-off in the local newspaper along with a journalist and a photo along with three players from another local top team, one white and two black men. Even they were completely naked. Lola and the soccer player had no children, so he divorced quickly and cheaply. English tabloids love scandals with soccer players' wives, so Lola became very famous and fled the country as soon as she sold her story to one of the tabloids. She returned to her hometown and started inviting her old friend Sandra to various events. Sandra was flattered and began spending more and more time with her, even though they had nothing in common and had never spoken to each other in all the years Lola had spent in England as the wife of a wealthy soccer player. Sandra had never been invited to visit her, but now she was back to being Lola's helpful best friend. Of course, most of the things they did together were completely innocent, and at first, my only objection was that Sandra started spending more evenings with Lola than with her family. I didn't like it at all when they even started having hen parties that dragged on well into the night. We had a pretty serious fight about it when I told her that if, or when, I found out she was cheating on me, it would mean an immediate divorce. All conversations like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, please forgive me, and I'll never do it again would be completely useless. She told me she understood, and I had no reason to worry. However, the very next week she went out again and came home at 5, in the morning completely drunk and refused to give me a plausible explanation of where and with whom she had spent the night. Then things got even worse when Sandra came home two days later and told me that Lola had received money from England, invited her over, and promised to pay for a week's vacation in Plaid de Ang in Gran Canaria. She hoped I wouldn't have any objections, and if I did, she didn't care. I'd had enough and said to her, why should I care? You can stay there forever. Just tell me where I can send your things. She was surprised and exclaimed, what the hell are you talking about? I can't and don't want to stop you if you want to leave and get with that damn. But if you do, you can stay there or go anywhere you want, but don't come back here. Please tell me where I can send your things. She started crying, you're a jealous bastard who doesn't trust his wife and lets her do everything on her own without watching her 24 hours a day. The worst that can happen is that I can entertain myself on my own instead of being a ma for you. You can entertain yourself all you want, the whole world is around you. You can leave whenever you want. Lola is enough for me, and frankly, I don't mind whether you go with her or not. She didn't go. Lola went off on her own for two weeks, and now that Lola was gone, Sandra even stayed home and took care of family matters a little more than she had before. But I felt like I had lost Sandra, whom I had married forever, and our relationship was in serious disarray and had been for some time. When we bought the house, we, like the rest of our neighbors, even purchased one thirty-second of the playground next door. We both paid an annual fee to maintain it, and every year in June, we had a garden party with a barbecue on Saturday. Lola wasn't home yet, and Sandra and I spent most of the time together. 
The usual program started with games for the youngest children, then other games for the adults, and a disco for the teenagers. We spent the last hour before the official part of the party closed at 23.00 to slow tunes in the disco tent. I danced several times with a pretty brunette named Mary Helene, who had the most beautiful eyes and the sweetest smile I had ever seen. This year, Sandra and I and four other couples were invited to Lena and Patrick's house to have even more fun. To my great joy, even Marie Hella and Dan joined us. Each year, these parties got wilder and wilder, thanks to the EU's cheap German booze, which is available at these parties in large quantities. Lena and Patrick had set aside a free space to dance in their living room, and with the lights almost completely off, we had a great time. Then Lena came up with a great idea. While on vacation in Greece, they happened upon a beach party where everyone, women, and men alike, were dancing topless, which was very sensual. Four couples agreed, and two went home. To my great joy, Maria Allen and her boyfriend Dan stayed. During a slow tune with her, I got turned on, and she sensed it and whispered in my ear that I should sleep with her. I told her she could count on me, and then Lena came up with a new idea again. There was an old black and white American movie on TV on Sunday night, in which all the couples invited to a party threw their car keys into a bowl, and when they left, the wives took one from the bowl and left with the one who owned the car. Of course, we couldn't drive the cars that night, and Lena told us we didn't need to. She had four rooms available, and we could have privacy for one hour. It was up to each couple to decide what they wanted to do. To my surprise, all eight agreed. Sandra smiled happily, noticing that I had no objections. Lena and Patrick must have thought of everything in advance because they had a plan to make a choice. Patrick took a deck of cards, picked out the kings and queens, laid them out in two groups face up, shuffled them, and placed a king in front of each man with the wrong side up. The women then took one card from the remaining deck. Sandra got the ace of hearts and was allowed to be the first to choose one of the queens that were face up. She got the Queen of Clubs. After that, we men were allowed to look at our cards, and the club's king went to Marie Hella's boyfriend Dan. Next to choose was Lena, who was lucky enough to get fourth husband Jerry, a handsome local soccer star who had been close to Sandra for the past few hours. I noted how envious Sandra was of Lena. Marie Helene was chosen next, and my heart hammered in my chest at the 50% chance of getting the girl of my dreams. I had the king of hearts, and my heart nearly stopped when Marie Hella laid out her queen. It was the queen of hearts. Sandra and her ace got the bedroom included in the first price. Marie Helene and I got one of the children's bedrooms included in the third price, and there we found that Lena had spread out an air mattress on the floor, and on the pillow was a small bottle of sparkling wine and three packs of condoms. We started with a deep kiss, then I kissed her hard and then laid her down on the bed. Within a few minutes, she was already in great ecstasy, and even I had to let her go. Now we opened the wine and chatted, waiting for me to come to my senses for the third act. Maria Len told me that her relationship with Dan was no longer good. He started treating her badly and even hit her once. I told her about my problems with Sandra, who was now jealous of Lola's single life and was increasingly abandoning her family. Marie Hella told me that a rumor had reached her at work that Lola and some other girl had been invited to entertain two high-profile clients who had recently visited a local business. I don't know if it was a joke or not. When Marie Hella told me that she wished Dan would keep Sandra with him forever, and she and I would be together, I replied that I didn't care what Dan and Sandra did, but if she wanted me, I was hers. Now she got serious and said she was in love with me, and if I felt the same way, we could meet the following Monday when we sobered up. I agreed and told her I loved her, after which we used a third condom. The hour ended and we all gathered in the kitchen for one last drink before heading out into the night. No one said much, I think some were embarrassed about the past hour, but I was only happy. When we got home, Sandra and I had a drink and a fun chat, and she, tipsy, started bragging about how well Dan had treated her. I said I was glad she had a good time and asked if our party had been as much fun as the one Lola had told me they had been to a while back. She happily boasted, yes, but it was much more classy, real champagne, oysters, lobsters, and all that. We didn't dance topless, we danced naked, much sexier. How did you choose your partners for lovemaking, a lottery or something?
No, of course not, the guys themselves had to seduce us, only two of them managed to seduce me. I'm a sturdy married woman, you know. Lola is such a and slept with everyone. I had heard enough and told her, good girl, who only cheated on me twice, but as you must know, that's too much for our marriage. It's over, and from now on, you can sleep in the spare room until we go our separate ways. She almost sobered up and screamed, you bastard, you tricked me by talking too much. You never talked to Lola. She then began to cry hysterically and left for the spare bedroom. Sandra stayed in bed until 2 o'clock when she came out of the bedroom room in a complete mess and asked me if I was serious about what I had said to her last night. I answered in the affirmative and couldn't resist saying that Lola's kind offer to invite her to Gran Canaria was probably just her share of their company for what she had earned with her body. On Monday, Maria Elaine and I took the day off and drove to a summer house belonging to one of my co-workers. She asked me if I remembered what I had said and promised her on Saturday night, and if it still stood. My yes elicited a look back from her, after which we began intense lovemaking. A few minutes later, of course, it was a quantum leap for both of us, so we even spent most of the time discussing how we wanted to continue our lovemaking. To our surprise, we had almost identical expectations in most matters. Six months later, we were married at City Hall. Sandra and Dan lived together, and things seemed to be going well between them, but she often told me that she must have gone completely crazy when she listened more to Lola's advice than to her own common sense. Sandra fully admitted her vagaries to me and promised to testify when I found out that these important clients represented a state-owned company. I made inquiries about some senior opposition politicians who provided useful leaks to the evening tabloids, who, thanks to Lola's reputation in England, hyped the case into a national political sex scandal. Both the buyers and the local company were sued for bribes, and the order was cancelled. Lola left town.